Uh, I vote should I uh, make the technical announcement for Chinese first? Okay, uh, now I will. Okay, now I, I will. Uh, I will explain how to uh, how to choose the Chinese uh, uh, channel, but uh, uh, for the English speaker, you don't need to uh, pay attention on it. Okay, it's only for Chinese listener. Yeah. 好的，欢迎各位这个华语区的朋友们哈。呃，我是这个校园工程社的魏明宇，非常高兴能够作为这个。协助方来主办这次2022这个世界各的管协会的亚洲首届论坛 用电脑的朋友们可以这个呃在电脑上选上你的声音哈，现在应该可以听到我的声音。然后呃选择这个传译的这个按钮，现在还没有哈，你们可以。呃，Louis have you uh, have you already set uh set uh, Ihua as the interpreter? If not, if not, please do it now. Yeah. 好的马上那个主持人会把我们的同团的这个翻译给设成这个译者然后我们就可以看到这样的一个按钮然后我们这个如果看不到的话可以点更多因为每个人的这个可能是不一样这是然后我们在收听的过程中哈然后第一要保持
seize them quickly without delay. Sacred, public secret. Rejoice in true appearance and in the serious play. Nothing alive is just one. It is always manifold. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the first World Goetheanum Association Asia Forum. We're uh, most happy to be able to do this with you. We have participants from several countries of Europe, East and West, and uh, many countries of Asia from Bangladesh all the way to Japan. And um, as you have already noticed, we have uh, the English speaking channel here. And what you cannot see are most of the Chinese participants because the most of the Chinese participants participate through another platform. So this is a technical trick uh, to uh, mirror this event also to uh, China. And uh, so we'll be probably another 60 or 70 people in China. Welcome to all of you in China as well. Um, the music that you heard, most of you heard, was uh, played by Aurelio and some friends in Auroville in India. His enterprise, their enterprise is called Swaram and they have been for several decades producing most amazing therapeutic uh, instruments, musical instruments. And we're very happy that they are partners of our World Gutianum Association. Thank you very much. And uh, if you stay on for the, um, for the forum, you will hear more music of them and also of other people who have agreed to play special music for this event or agreed that their music would be played. One of them is also, I think, present here, Jörg Brandt from Germany. Another one is uh, Paul Giger from Switzerland. And uh, we have also music from Asia and America. This moment is a special moment, not only because it's an historic event that we do this for the first time, but also um, when you ask a person, where does the sun rise and where does the sun set? Usually they will say in the east and in the west. And that is only true today. And tomorrow it's not anymore true because like all rhythms, they are constantly changing. And so the day lengths, the night lengths, and uh, the place where the sun rises and sets changes every day. And only two times a year at the equinox, it's uh, the same. And it's all over the planet. We have the same day length and night length. Very special moment in time. And there are other planetary and cosmic happenings at this time, which are, um, quite amazing. One of them is that four planets, two of the visible ones and two of the invisible ones are retrograde. That uh, produces obviously some kind of uh, uh, will to look back, to review and to take time to do things, which we have really experienced here on site also. And then of course, the new moon on Sunday, Sunday night, depending on where you are, um, and I think that's quite a nice uh, happening that we go in this conference and at the end of it, we have something like a new beginning. So this whole conference is kind of set up like a transformation process. And I can already say at this point in time, those who have only signed up for the event tonight, they're um, very uh, much invited to still sign up. We can, you could still do that tonight or till tomorrow, tomorrow morning till 9 a.m. Manila, Beijing time. It's still time to sign up for the whole forum. And that we have found such an amazing personality to open this conference is uh, we cannot describe the happiness and pride that we feel for that. Um, 
when Rudolf Steiner was asked, what is life? His answer was study the rhythm. And one could say that Maximilian Moser is in a way a grandchild of Steiner in that he is the second generation of uh, scientific chronobiologists. And the first generation was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, Professor Hildebrand and others. And um, as far as I know, Maximilian Moser studied directly with Hildebrand and in a way got transferred his work. I myself um, have known Maximilian Moser all my life, so to say, when, you know, as far as I can look back, I've always heard amazing thing, things of, uh, from this personality. And one special thing I, I told so many times over the years, maybe over 15, 20 years, I told this story so many times that at the end, I was wondering, if it's at all true, <laughs> because I could not anymore trace it back from where it came from. And that was the story that, you know, due to their research at um, the Huaneum Institute in, in Graz, they found that, you know, when we just, um, when we really um, look at the rhythms of the human heart, we can really find what ails or what not yet ails this person and can give um, good suggestions what this person can do for his or her health. And that was this famous experiment with uh, an Austrian insurance company that they had 5% of all working days of construction workers were sick days. And after um, research with Maximilian Moser and treatment, uh, six weeks, I think, of urethmy the sick days went down to zero. So if that's not interesting, and there's so many other interesting things. Um, so what Maximilian Moser is providing, one of the things he's providing is a health guide system. And I'm mentioning that only because also, um, it would also be because we have an entrepreneurial forum here, we have entrepreneurs, we have business people. It would also be a very good, uh, possibility to introduce something so really good into countries of Asia um, and yeah help really the people uh, take care of their health so let let's ask him to speak himself thank you very much Max for coming and I wish you all a very insightful evening afternoon and morning thank you Thank you very much, Walter, and hello to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to uh, talk in this forum and at this special day, especially. And um, I would like to mention that I will concentrate on the art, the, the possibilities that art gives to make people more healthy and to keep them healthy in this today's lecture. Now, um, let us go to the to the screen, um, which I have prepared for you. And the secret of Momo will be solved in the end of the lecture. So please be patient. It will take a little time, but you will understand it better afterwards. What you can see here is um, a so-called x-ray cinematogram of the human heart so you can see the human heart beating actually um, by x-rays and the most interesting thing is that um, some years ago a friend of mine philip kilner from the royal brompton hospital was able to visualize the movement of the blood within the heart and you can see here a picture that was also on the cover of the nature um, a journal, which is the most prestigious journal in uh, science, and it shows that the blood is actually moving in the shape of a vortex, a vortex um, that's in every of the four chambers, as we know now, and in the center of each vortex, you always have a point which is very still, which actually has no movement. So we have four points of 
um, no movement within our body in the heart, um, in the center of these vortices. Now, when I looked into the internet for heart um, to see how the different figures um, in different cultures looked like, I found this very interesting picture, which is a Chinese calligraphic representation. Um, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, seen that that's um, the Chinese sign for heart and soul, which is all, in all traditional, traditional cultures, it is the same, the heart and the soul, because obviously uh, the soul was considered to sit within the heart or be part of the heart. And what you see here is that opposite to the usual display of heart, representation of heart, you can see that the Chinese obviously choose the energetic um, representation and not the morphological representation that we have in the Western culture. And you can see that this vortex that you see here in a picture that was first made in the year 2000 was already known to the Chinese maybe 3000 or 4000 years ago. And we found a lot of um, hints that in traditional cultures, we have such knowledge, which has been lost over times and has been refound by science without knowing that it was known already long before. And um, it's very interesting to use this um, knowledge and uh, to investigate things under the aspects of traditional cultures, which will help you to understand the essence of human being much better than if you have only the Western science that we have. Now, as Walter already mentioned, um, our main goal is to investigate the rhythms of the human body. And this is a, a representation of these rhythms, an overview that was created by Gunther Hildebrandt, this first generation um, teacher who was my teacher also, and we spend a lot of time discussing things and talking about the possibilities of chronodiagnosis and chronotherapies. That means you can use time um, and the structure of time to investigate the state of the human um, organism, to investigate the health, the degree of health somebody has, which is quite opposite to modern medicine, which always investigates space, spatial and chemical things and not um, temporal things. And I think this is a big um, possibility for future medicine to use time as a diagnostic tool as well as a therapeutic tool. And it addresses something that we will find out during this lecture that we have not only a, a body which is in space and um, energy, and in, um, in the uh, substance, but it's also in time. We are structured in time and the time structure of our organism is indicative of our health state. Now, um, if you look at this um, diagram, you can see that it's exponential uh, in its representation. So you, you have an exponential scale, not a linear scale in the time domain. And you see that different organismic functions are represented in different time scales. And you see that here's the circadian rhythm or the one day rhythm, which separates the rhythm in chronobiology into infradian rhythms and ultradian rhythms. The infradians are slow ones. And with these slow rhythms, we are actually connected directly to cosmos. With the solar year, for example, which we just pass in a special moment at this time, this solar year um, um, influences the growth in our organism. It influences environmental adaptations uh, of many parameters. So when you investigate them, you find out that uh, many of like, like heart rate or body temperature are changing during the year and we adapt to the outside conditions. But this we do in a way which is preempting the real things. So um, we are first adapting and then comes the change in the outside um, 
parameters. And if the weather changes very fast, this makes problems because we are not yet adapted. But in a normal year, we would, we would adapt during the uh, run of the year um, by an interior clock, which is not uh, very well investigated yet, because it takes a lot of time to investigate a year-long rhythm, of course. Therefore, the circadian rhythm is much better investigated in science. And it has received the Nobel Prize in 2017 uh, when the medical um, uh, um, people of Stockholm um, realized that this was an enormous medical possibility to use the circadian rhythm. So the first Nobel Prize for chronomedicine was given in, uh, was awarded in 2017. And um, between this Earth Day, which um, controls the sleep-wake cycle and the storage within the body, the metabolism, um, and the solar year, we have a third cycle, which is not so well accepted in medicine, but which is obviously present in marine animals. If you look at marine animals, you can see that these marine animals have connected their reproduction cycle totally to the lunar cycle. Most of the marine animals use it as a dating tool for the right time to meet. Um, for example, the Palolo worm at the, in the Fiji Islands comes up to the, um, to the surface of the water to meet uh, and to uh, reproduce. Um, at a special time of the year, it is the first full moon of the a south um, hemispheric year, which means it's Easter time in the south of our planet. Um, and this is um, actually the, the time in October in the, on the southern hemisphere. And during this lunar cycle, this special lunar cycle, there are just two to three days where these worms meet and nobody knows how they know um, the connection between lunar and solar cycle. But what I want to say with this is that um, also humans uh, descend from marine animals somehow. And so it's very likely that our reproduction cycle of 28 days, the menstruation cycle, is of course a lunar cycle, which is um, nowadays no more connected directly, but in former times it probably was. And I think um, there are also hints that several other physiological parameters are connected to this lunar cycle. Now, this were, were the cosmic cycles that we are aware of. It's easily possible that there are slower ones, which um, are beyond the scope of science because they are so slow. But um, for example, we know that there is an 11-year cycle of the solar um, flat points that are on the sun. Um, and so there might be other solar cycles which influence human physiology. But then we have some inner cycles and it's very interesting to observe these inner cycles. And the fastest one are the nervous system cycles. That means, for example, the action potential of the nerve, which is about one thousandth of a second, or also the slow slower waves like alpha waves in the brain. These are um, intrinsic for the nervous system. And the nervous system is very fast and therefore very close to death because it doesn't have the possibility to generate energy or even to store energy. The nervous system is absolutely dependent on the other body systems and especially the metabolism, which produces with very slow cycles of an hour or even a day, um, it produces the energy that's necessary for all the other, other systems. And interestingly, this is not only situated um, morphologically um, on the, on the uh, other end of the body, but also in the time domain. And you have between the metabolism and the nervous system, the cardiorespiratory system, which connect the nervous system and the metabolic system. This cardiorespiratory system um, gives the connection 
And you can see maybe that um, what the alchemists in the medieval times and also in other parts of the world teach that there is something like a principle called sal, um, which is in the nervous system, the, the salt. Um, nervous system is based on the Hodgkins-Huxley um, equilibrium, which means that the salts play a very important role in generating nerve action. And on the other hand, you have the sulfur principle in um, alchemy, which means uh, that uh, sulfur always stinks a little bit. Um, and you have this sulfur principle in the metabolism and you can smell it if you have access to products of metabolism, um, that this is uh, something connected to sulfur and it's a high energy um, part of the organism. And in between these two is the Mercur of the alchemistic system, which says that um, Mercurio, the um, messenger of the gods, connects the metabolism and the nervous system. And uh, the uh, energy is brought from the metabolism to the nervous system, and uh, information is brought from the nervous system to the metabolism. So interestingly, we have a strong um, understanding of the body when we use alchemistic principles, which is um, rarely demonstrated in physiology, but here we can obviously see it. Then there's another connection to these biological rhythms, which I would like to share with you. And this is the part of music. If you investigate music, then you see that the sound of music is just the frequencies that you find in the nervous system from about 10 Hertz to 1000 Hertz are the base frequencies of musical tones. Everything above 1000 Hertz is overtones that are not used in music as um, bass tones, but just to make the sound of the instruments. Then in the cardiorespiratory system, you have, of course, the heartbeat. And the heartbeat is exactly what the composers use for the beat of the music. And if you take the measure of music, which is about four beats, for example, then you have exactly the a connection between heartbeat and respiration, which is four to one. If you, um, if you look at the subject during the night when it's re relaxed and in a um, very um, relaxed state. Then metabolism is still missing and you find the wavelength of metabolism in the length of pieces. So musical pieces, if you take a short song for of a few seconds, or if you take a Wagner opera, which will take maybe six or eight hours to perform, then you are in the range of the metabolism. So the whole music and the whole organism are congruent and are represented in the same time domains. Um, the, you could deduce from this, that music is um, audible body sounds, actually. It's the music of the body that's uh, played in the music of the, of the world. And I think that's really true. And also the other way around, you can influence the metabolism, you can influence the heart and the nervous system by music, by the principle of resonance, if you have the same um, periodicity in music and body, then this will be a resonance. And I think that maybe this is more explanation for the effects of music than um, uh, hormones that are usually taken into account, like um, glucks, uh, like, like um, hormones of joy and so. But actually, it's a question maybe of resonance. And in the future, we might use music and um, vibration to heal people and to help people stay healthy. Now, um, humans have used music for a rather long time. This is one of the oldest musical instruments that have been found in Germany. Um, it was found in a, in a, um, in a hole, I don't know the, the English word for this, in a uh, cave, in a cave um, uh, near 
Blaubeuren in Germany, and it was uh, carved during the Ice Age when there was a thick ice shield across all Europe. And at the border of this shield, there were some rivers. And on the um, border of the rivers, there were some caves. And in these caves, people lived who obviously were artists. They made musical instruments. They also made very beautiful statues. And the age was determined at at least 35,000 years. And what was very interesting is the scale of this instrument. They rebuilt it, and it's a pentatonic scale. You find this in Chinese music, as far as I know, as well as in Arabic music. So this has survived 30, at least 35,000 years of human history. And I think that this is the beginning of the human culture that you can observe here. Now, in Tanzania, I was when I was uh, finished my studies, I was uh, traveling through Tanzania and visited um, villages and I saw women preparing their meals at this time. And you can see that they are very um, lucky during this uh, procedure. So even if it's hard work, uh, they are laughing and uh, they are singing during this procedure and also clapping their hands. And in many traditional cultures, you find this singing during the work, which makes work probably much easier, which helps people to overcome the hardness of their manual work. And they look very happy indeed. And if you talk to them, they laugh and they have fun and um, they enjoy the, the work because they use their working instruments as musical instruments. It's actually like a musical instrument. They clap the hand during the upstroke and uh, uh, sing during the whole procedure. And when you walk today into a, a subway station and look at the people in the evening when they come back from work, say they, most of them look so sad, actually. And I always say we do something wrong in our society because we are no more happy during work. We should be happy when we are working because this is very important for our health too. Now, um, what I will like to show you now is a proof that traditional um, ways of thinking were not so wrong as uh, some um, stupid um, Westerners uh, think. Uh, when the Isa Islands were discovered. They also discovered these um, moais, which are the heads in the Easter, uh, on, on the Easter Island shore. And these moais uh, weighed more than five tons usually. And nobody knew how they came from the quarry where they were constructed to the beach where, where they were installed. And that, that was about five kilometers from one place to the other. And Easter Island people had not discovered the wheel yet, and they had not um, streets in the in their island. So the white people asked them, how did the Moai come from this quarry to the beach? And they said that was quite easy. They went on themselves. And as Westerners are very skeptic, they didn't believe this, of course until National Geographic magazine made uh, some very interesting experiment. And I would like to show you this experiment, which proved that the people were not so wrong with what they told the Westerners. Who said I couldn't walk? So you see, um, the uh, truth is some of the times different to what we expect, uh, but it's closer to what the people told them, the white ones, than what the white ones skeptics um, expected. Now, why did I show you this video? Because it shows one of the principles of oscillation, which is also used in the human body. It's the principle of resonance on one hand, 
which makes work much easier than if you don't use resonance. And the second thing is that um, you can stabilize even as a toy uh, structure by moving it periodically. And everybody who goes with a bicycle knows that it's very hard to stop with a bicycle totally and keep balance. You need the movement. And this is done in our body very extensively. And there's almost no function in our body that's not moving. That means rhythm is essential for life, um, just like Udo Steiner also mentioned in his answer to, uh, to uh, Hauschka, Dr. Hauschka. Now, this was our start in chronobiology. Actually, it was in 1991, and we had prepared this for more than two years. Um, it was a space uh, medical experiment, which we participated. We had three um, of the Austrian experiments in the space station Mir. And these experiments investigated actually different aspects of um, oscillations in the body, mechanical oscillations, and also oscillations of the cardiovascular system. And in the top of this um, rocket, you can see here, there was uh, three cosmonauts, one of them an Austrian, and also our equipment, which we had performed before. This was the docking maneuver, which we kindly got from the Austrian cosmonaut, the, the slides. And uh, here you see the Austrian cosmonaut on the left side, and what he's wearing, is something very stylish. It's, a, uh, it's our sensor jacket that we made for him. And it was made from natural materials like wool and linen, old uh, peasant linen that we had bought on the flea market because that was the highest quality uh, weaving that we could get. And um, it was colored uh, together with a Waldorf school, which made, um, the, the um, color setting and uh, we colored it with natural uh, colors like um, apple tree park or reseda for the yellow or indigo for the blue and every color mean, meant something so that the cosmonaut knew um, which uh, part he, he was using for example here all the sensors were housed and um, the yellow thing was the background of the sensors and so on. Now, when we constructed this, we were part of a team of 14 Austrian experiments. And uh, the others thought we were a little bit crazy, of course, with this um, extravagant design and natural colors. But they stopped thinking when um, the Russians investigated all these things for their chemical composition, because no poison uh, is allowed into the space station, because it will accumulate in the air condition of the space station. And so they investigated every plastic part of the thing and every um, component for its chemical composition. And so many uh, other experiments had to be changed because they used um, PVC, um, plastics and so then came our experiment we were the last ones and they said um, when we asked what are our things to do they said no comment and we asked what does it mean and they said uh, you don't have to change anything that's everything all right because there were no chemically um, poisonous things coming out of the jacket so in the end the uh, travels with all these natural materials had proved to be much better than using plastics without thinking what the consequences of this is. And I think this was something that I also learned for my uh, personal life, that it makes sense to use natural materials. And we later proved in many uh, studies that natural materials are much nicer to the human organism than the chemistry that is produced today. Now, one thing we also like uh, learned is that a cosmonaut or an astronaut, a taikonaut must not become sick, must not become sick. There's no medical doctor in space and you can't sh uh, shoot one up because uh, there are very few 
uh, slices of time when you can send um, help to the cosmonauts. And this was very interesting for me because I thought, why don't we think in medicine like this? Our patients must not become sick. We have to do everything to keep them from getting sick and not only treat them when they are sick already. And I think this is an um, excess that was also used in Chinese medicine. And we will talk about this later on. Now, one of the interesting things that we found, the most interesting things actually, were these many, many oscillations. These are the oscillations of heart rate. That means if you, um, the, the lowest part shows the so-called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and you see here uh, 120 seconds, so two minutes of recording of the heartbeat from beat to beat. And you see that the heart rate is not stable. It changes all the time. Actually, it changes with each inspiration and with each expiration. It gets a little bit faster when you make an inspiration. It gets a little bit slower when you make an expiration. And this is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And it's um, controlled by the so-called vagus nerve, which is very important for our health, as we see later. Now, the stronger this oscillation is, the better it is actually, which is very un understandable for ordinary doctors because they think that stability like homeostasis will be the right way to look at the organism. But actually, it's variability that's important for the body. We have to be variable, we have to be flexible, we have to be adaptive then our organism is stable. That's opposite to a car where you don't want to have oscillations. Um, here you have um, the need for oscillations to be healthy. As, um, oscillations uh, make stability in the human organism. Then again, two minutes um, of recording here in a, under a different condition, whereas the respiratory sinus arrhythmia was under the condition of rest and relaxation, these um, rhythms occurred when the person was calculating mathematical problems. And um, it, it was a little bit stress, but it was in the oil stress, which means that people had control over the situation. And then the body starts to oscillate in a different rhythm, which is not four seconds like with respiration, but rather 10 seconds. Um, and this is the oscillations that you also find in blood pressure. Now, interestingly, this is the rhythm when you are concentrated. So it means um, relaxation um, and rehabilitation and um, recreation is um, the, the heart connects with the, with the lung, with the respiration, whereas if you're stressed, but in control, then the heart connects to the blood pressure rhythm. And this is the rhythm, obviously, of um, consciousness, of personality. When you have strong personalities, you find they have strong blood pressure rhythms, usually. Then you have here a third rhythm, which is also important. And we will see these three rhythms in many of the future pictures I will show you. And this is peripheral circulation. Now we have not two minutes like before, but we have 10 minutes. And you see, this is uh, occurring when you are, especially in emotional uh, situations. And especially during dreams, for example, when dreams are very emotional, then you have this peripheral circulation rhythm, which is about one minute in period length. It can also be half a minute, but one minute is the um, basic frequency of this. So actually we have three rhythms, which are very helpful to um, understand the situation of the person. Is the person in recreation, like during deep sleep, then you have the respiration. If it's um, conscious and wake, then you have these blood pressure rhythms. And if it is in emotional situations, then you have the peripheral circu circulatory rhythms. And you, of course, um, if you are ashamed or 
uh, happy, then your face will get red or pale, depending on your personality. And this is the rhythm of the peripheral circulation that you can observe here. Then there are slower rhythms. Here we have eight hours of recording during the night, and you can see a two hour rhythm, which is very helpful if you are working. If you organize your work around these two hour rhythms, you improve your sleep and you help um, also to learn to sleep in the right way. Um, I think there's one person coming. Um, now, this is called the basic rest and activity cycle. It's a 90 minute to one uh, to two hour rhythm. And you, you can organize your work as a practical um, hint. You can organize your work in one and a half hour plus half an hour break uh, cycles. And you will see that you will have much more effectivity of your work. You will um, achieve more. Um, possibilities when you do this, then you, if you work continuously through without a break. Then the slowest rhythm shown here is the circadian rhythm. And you can see that every of these rhythms, these are two days after each other, um, 48 hours of recording. You can see that every rhythm that we saw in the diagram before is also present in the heart rhythm. So you can use this as a tool for chronobiology, which uh, gives you the display of all these body rhythms. So we, what we did is to make a very precise instrument to measure the heartbeat intervals. And this is something that has to be understood. Uh, we are not uh, measuring the ECG or something like this, but from the ECG, we just measure one point that's the R peak and this to one eight thousandths of a second. And then uh, we measure the next R peak and the, the space between the two is the information that we use. And this space always changes. So over 24 hours, we have about 100,000 heartbeats. And it looks like this, if you make a frequency diagram, which means here we have the frequencies and here we have the time running. And this is the afternoon and this is the night. And here we have the morning. And you can see how the night transforms uh, this diagram uh, where you have frequencies in the high frequency range, which are mainly coming from vagal um, nerves to the low frequency range, which are, are mainly coming from the sympathetic nerve. And during the night, you see that a lot of order, that's just one line, which is corresponding to a sound in music. And this line is the line of recreation, and it is the representation of respiration during uh, in the heartbeat. Okay, so let us remember that the heart is the strongest electric field in the human body, and it gives access to um, the, all these body rhythms. And now we will work with this to investigate some things that you cannot investigate in a different way. Um, as I told you, we make this time diagrams of spectral heart rate composition. And we have the respiration here, the respiratory peak, which, give, which gives this line. And we have the blood perfusion peak. Um, in this case, the blood pressure peak is missing because it was recorded during the night. And during the night, you have no consciousness and therefore you don't have blood pressure written in a good well sleep night. And here you can see the difference between a well and a, a good sleep and a bad sleep. The good sleep is on the right side, the bad sleep on the left side. Now, what's the main difference? The main difference is the order of the two things. If the night is well ordered, like here, then you have a good night. Uh, Medical people talk about um, so-called sleep architecture. And this sleep architecture is not well recorded here. Um, this, it's the same person which was traced here in the first night in the sleeping lab, whereas here it was in the second night. And during the second night, um, the person was tired because it hadn't slept during the first night. So therefore you have this, um, 
better sleep here in the second night. And if you go to a sleep laboratory, you always have to at least uh, spend two nights to measure your sleep. Whereas with our equipment, we can measure immediately because it doesn't disturb sleep. Now, 2014 or 13, it was discovered that there are channels in our brain and these channels are emptied during the night and perfused by liquid. It has got a name of its own since so the so-called glymphatic system, um, which was when, when I um, studied medicine, I would have been thrown out of the examination if I said that there is a lymphatic system in the brain. But now we know that there is a lymphatic system and it even has a name of its own. It's the glymphatic system. And every night these channels go up and um, are perfused by fluid. So the brain is chemically cleaned in some way. And in the morning they close again. And we have the, the, closed, um, the channels closed. Therefore, they didn't discover it before because only in the working brain, it, um, they can be observed. And this is a mouse brain. Um, this observation wouldn't be possible in a human, but they are definitely also in our brain. Now, um, you might be familiar with the Chinese organ watch, with organ clock, which is very interesting because it orders all these meridians of the Chinese medicine um, to a special time of the day. And we cooperated with the German Acupuncture Society, uh, which investigated these things also, and wanted to know if there is some Western um, medical proof of this uh, Chinese organ watch. So we looked at our diagrams, which represent the oscillations of the body and looked if there is a connection to this organ watch. And again, the same picture that I showed you before, but now we will put in the times of the different meridians. And you see the gallbladder meridian is here, the lung meridian is here, uh, sorry, the liver meridian, then the lung meridian and the large intestine. In the bad sleep, you don't have good correlation. But if you do the same with a good sleep, you see now the things are very well matched. That means that um, in a person who is sleeping well, you have exactly the periods of the Chinese organ clock in the reg registrations of the heartbeat um, rhythms, which was already a very interesting um, investigation. So now we looked during the day, but during the day you can't see these um, intervals. No, these are now all the 12 meridians that I put in. But you see, as soon as you reach the night, you have borders which are close to the borders the meridian um, uh, suggests, which means that actually the organ clock is, is um, can be um, ascertained if you look during the night, whereas during the day, this might be not as good as during the night. Okay. Now we had a patient who had an interesting pattern in his autonomic nervous system recordings, which we um, computed from these heart rate intervals. You can see here um, in the diagram that he has a peak during the night. Normally you would expect that, um, for example, the heart rate or the autonomic nervous system goes down during the night. But in this case, it went up at a special time. And this was reproducible. We made uh, three recordings with him and always during the same time of the night, this patient had this strange, um, sympathetic drive during the night, which is unusual. Usually uh, you should have a um, um, parasympathetic drive during the night and not sympathetic. Now, um, when we looked at the organ clock, we saw that this was the liver time. Um, around one to two to three o'clock in the morning is the liver time. And it was always at this time, approximately at this time. And so we asked him if he had some problems with the liver. 
And he really got pale because he said he doesn't have problems with his liver, but his mother died from familiar cirrhosis, which is a liver disease as, um, leading to death. Uh, and she hadn't drunk alcohol during her lifetime, but still she died from liver cirrhosis. Um, so obviously he was genetically influenced by his familial uh, liver cirrhosis so that he has strong um, sympathetic drive during in the middle of the night. Now, um, this was just one example I wanted to show you um, how this type of investigations that we make could be used as a modern Chinese um, organ clock um, and diagnosis instrument, pulse diagnosis instrument. And we found, we also found that in cancer patients, these rhythms are drastically reduced. You can see here three cancer patients recorded for 24 hours each. And you see that even in the patient on the left side, that's a 51 year old uh, patient with breast cancer um, who doesn't have metastasis, um, but the day the, the, the rhythms are very strange during the day. There is no clear uh, separation between day and night, uh, but still there's um, enough energy, enough uh, rhythmic movement in the heartbeat so that this person is not very sick, um, not uh, at least not so sick that um, it's dangerous for her at this moment. Now, Another patient that had lung, lung metastasis uh, to, with, his can, with her cancer uh, showed a uh, reduced, it's the same age, but you see that the rhythms are already reduced. And if you go to the right side, you see that in tumor cachexia, which is the last state of um, tumor disease, um, there's the, a total loss of rhythms. And we observed this many times that cancer patients which are in terminal state um, completely use their rhythms. So they, um, the, the, the loss of rhythm is connected with the loss of life actually. But the fortunate thing is that you also can make interventions and these interventions will help you to gain rhythms again. And this is an example of a medical doctor which we um, put into a rhythm therapy, which consisted of Eurythmy. We will uh, later hear how Eurythmy can help construction workers as Walter already announced. Um, but here we did it with a medical doctor. And this was the, the, on the left side, you see the recording before the rhythm therapy. You can see here, um, especially this um, rhythm of the respiration, this line, which is produced by respiration, by respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And this is, this is a sign of strong vagal activity if it, the line is strong, but at this uh, place, the line is not very strong actually. And um, in the computation of the vagal activity, you see that there's just one phase during the night where this person, this medical doctor has a good sleep. Then he makes six weeks of eurythmy. And in the second um, recording, you see that the line is much stronger. He has improved due, due to this um, interventions. And also the rhythmicity of the night is much better. The sleep architecture is obviously much better. And you can see that he now has a parasympathetic phases where he um, is much uh, recreating much better than during the first sleep before the interventions. Then two years pass and this doctor for, unfortunately doesn't um, go on with the interventions. And you see that he's back to the beginning after two years, but at least um, he's not worse than before the interventions. And um, you can also see that the rhythmicity of the sleep is not as good as it was during the intervention time. <clears throat> now, if you look at younger people, you see that they are very vital. They have very strong uh, biological rhythms, um, also in the heartbeat. 
And this is a 12 and 11 year old boy, which was before puberty in a school in the city where our institute is. And you see here the afternoon, then the night and the morning. And you can see in the afternoon, he was already tired because um, in the higher parts of the frequencies, there were some activities which come from vaguely recreation. But due to the night, he was um, the, the um, tiredness was um, removed. And you can see here that in the morning, he's very energetic and all the rhythmic energy is here in the low frequency variability, which means that he is now sympathetically um, active. And you also can see this in this diagram where he oscillates between parasympathetic blue and sympathetic red um, during the afternoon. Then he goes into strong uh, parasympathetic uh, vagal activity and in the morning he is in sympathetic activity again. Then we measured a boy which was already in puberty, 14 years old. And you see how this changed. You see that now he has more um, this line of blood pressure written, which is um, indicative of personality, of um, the, the consciousness. But it totally destroyed night um, uh, rhythmicity. And the reason for this you can find here in the diagram, because he used to look television for the beginning of the night here, uh, which looked like a very good sleep. Obviously, the program was not very pleasant. So he went into sleep, but then he wake, wake up at midnight and he goes to play computer game. And you see here that now the rhythm gets disturbed and he has sympathetic drive, which he shouldn't have during the night. And in the morning, the three hours that he uses for sleeping are not very good sleep. And also the recreation of this boy is not very good. When we showed this to the pupils, they were very impressed that we could see all these things and this boy uh, promised that he would never uh, ever uh, play computer during the night. I hope that he uh, stuck to this, but I don't believe it uh, uh, actually. Um, but at least it helped him to understand uh, why computer play wouldn't be so favorable for his health. Now, I was already talking about this system of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous uh, system. And here you have a um, morphological display of these two systems. The red one is the sympathetic nervous system. And this red one uh, goes along the spine and it's our alarm system. It's for fight and flight. And also it's on the back of our body and on the large um, sensory organs like the eye and the ear. The reason for this is that these are the, the uh, organs which uh, warn us be, um, of danger. Um, and therefore the sympathetic nervous system is connected to this because it influences also the, the sharpness of our view. When the sympathetic uh, is, uh, nervous system is activated, we see um, uh, better, but it's at the cost of higher energy um, consumption. And therefore, we need the other system, which is which was very, very much uh, this uh, neglected in medicine before, because there was no possibility to measure this parasympathetic nervous system. And you see here the vagal or parasympathetic nervous system, which is around our close senses, like smelling, like tasting, and it has to do with our digestion. So it goes along the digestion tracked to the um, stomach and also to the heart here, and also to the reproductive system, where it is very important for reproduction. And I think that many problems of reproduction could be solved if people would um, take more time for the parasympathetic activities for the relaxation than they do at the moment. Now, 
Also in physiology, we know that every uh, part of the body, every important organ is connected to these two systems, to the sympathetic and to the parasympathetic. And so this is the main um, control system of the whole body activities. Here you have an overview which uh, part of our activities are controlled by which the sympathetic makes fight and flight, it makes rage, it um, is activated during rage, it um, achieves performance, and the hormones that are used are epinephrine on one hand and cortisol to um, break the uh, bad effects of epinephrine and to, to prevent um, too much epinephrine action because this can lead to heart attacks, to fibrillation of the heart and to um, conditions of high inflammation. And the um, antagonist for this is the vagal activity, the parasympathicus, which generates rest and sleep, regeneration, healing, recreation and reproduction. It's anti-inflammatory and it's particularly strong during sleep. And important is the balance between these two, because you can see this as the yang of our body and the parasympathetic system as the yin of our body. And as in many uh, fields, the yin has been neglected for a long time. Now, if you look at the rhythms that arise from these two systems, it's very characteristic for the sympathicus to have so-called stochastic activity, which means activity which is not harmonic, not um, like a sino sinoid, but it's distributed on many different frequencies, and this is called stochastic. Whereas the parasympathetic system produces rhythmic activity, which you can see in this, this line, that's the up and down of the respiration, but also in the long time, you see here, these uh, oscillations are rhythmic activity and they are typically for parasympathetic and this is a possibility to, to uh, investigate if the body is sympathetically or parasympathetically activated. The sympathicus promises freedom and I think this is the reason why it has been get uh, um, become so much attractive for uh, Western people who are um, very on the, in the search of freedom. Um, whereas the parasympathetic system um, achieves regeneration and healing and things like this. And um, of course, when you sleep, you, you don't have the freedom to move, except if you're in special dreams. But um, usually we are bound during regeneration and we are free during the sympathetic nervous system activity. And both, um, polarities have to be in um, harmony to lead a healthy and good life. Now, um, some years ago, it has been found, and this is very important for uh, today's problems that we have on one hand with the chronic diseases and on the other hand with so-called pandemics. Um, and we, there was a finding that the vagal activity is very important to control the immune system. The immune system is very um, wild. It's like a wild wolf, actually, because it has to be strong. It has to be rapid to, to uh, immediately kill um, uh, um, pathogenic germs that come into the body or even cancer cells. And to do this, um, the autonomic nervous system, uh, the, sorry, the immune system has, for example, this macrophage, the large um, white um, blood cells, which are in areas which are inflamed. You see the red background, that's the inflammation here. It's produced by these cells. And at the same time, the cells attract other cells, which come to this area to um, help this macrophage. To, to fight against intruders. Now, um, if this is the case, it's very good in the beginning, it's very important that it works, but after some time, 
Um, it has to be stopped when the invaders are killed or, or eliminated. It has to be stopped. And this stop, um, that's a new finding, is made via the vagus ner nerve. So if you have enough vagus activity, um, the brain senses that there is an inflammation somewhere in the body. It even knows where this inflammation is. There's something like a homunculus in the brain, which knows inflammation is there. And then it activates vagal fibers, which go into the other direction. And these vagal fi fibers control the inflammation and stop it. And this circle is called the vagal um, inflammation reflex, actually, and has become attention during the last years because it seems to be the first line of control for the immune system. If that doesn't work, th that's something like a fast disc break for the immune system to stop overactivity, which has been, for example, uh, observed in septic reaction after COVID-19, you know. And this overreaction can be stopped by activating the autonomic nervous system. There are some recent studies which have so shown that even electric stimulation of the vagal system will stop the bad effects of COVID-19, which are brought about by the, by, by the immune system itself. The immune system overreacts to this virus. And on the other hand, uh, the body has a second system, as usual, and this second system is something like a handbrake, which is slow and also gives us not a good feeling, because if we are driving with handbrake, then um, the, the driving is not very um, dynamic. And the way that it goes is via glucocorticoids, cortisol, uh, which is the second um, line of um, prevention of overreaction. Time magazine has found this so important that it uh, called inflammation the secret killer. And actually, many diseases from the uh, chronic disease range come from this overreaction of the autonomic nerve of the immune system and the little control of the autonomic nervous system. So if we improve our vagal control, we would be much um, healthier and would prevent many of the chronic diseases. And actually people who are living long have a strong vagal activity. Unfortunately, that's an investigation that we did. Um, with age, the autonomic nervous system gets less active. You see here um, the time of the day and uh, on the y-axis and the age of the person on the x. And when you get about 40, um, the vagal system gets very low and the sympathetic activity gets stronger. Fortunately, this is not a fate, but can be controlled by um, making uh, exercises. And everything that you know that is healthy, like for example, Tai Chi exercises or slow running or eating um, omega-3 increases the vagal activity. So the vagal activity seems to be very much connected to human health. And therefore we use this to improve human health by controlling the vagal activity and by investigating vagal activity and helping people to find interventions that are helpful for the vagal activity. And here you can see that also Ayurvedic cures have a good potential to improve the vagal system. This is a medical doctor who made, a female medical doctor who made um, Ayurvedic um, cure for three weeks. And this was before the cure and this after. And you can see here that the um, line of vagal activity during the night is becoming much stronger um, over the three weeks. So this is also a possibility to improve autonomic nervous system activity. And you see that the night is better structured here after the cure than before. Um, we measured the sleep quality, the objective uh, sleep quality, which was 26% only before this cure and 52% of the night, 52% of the night were um, good sleep. 
after the cure. And the biological age of the woman that was her mo uh, uh, most uh, favorable uh, experience, she became about three years younger when doing this uh, cure in her biological age. Now, um, if you look what um, is connected to burnout, you have here an example of a female medical doctor, she's 37 years old, which has a high workload, but at the same time, full energy. And you see on the other side of the picture, a manager of a construction company, 39 years old, close to burnout. And you can immediately see that the difference is especially in the night. Um, you have almost no vagal activity during the night in this manager and very strong in the female medical doctor, which means that this is the source of her energy that she has the possibility to recreate during the night. Now we come to a chapter which is very interesting too. And I think there are few methods that can find such uh, differences like we do with our heart rate variability or heart rhythm flexibility, as we call it. Uh, the power of art, which is um, represented here by speech therapy and by eurythmy. Um, these recordings were done by Dietrich von Ponin, who uh, cooperated with us, his um, speech therapist in Switzerland. And he um, made here a declamation of a poem that's a Nietzsche poem, actually, on the upper trace. And in the lower trace, that's a Mörike poem. And it's written in hexameter. Hexameter is the Greek um, verse form, which was used in the Greek theater also. And you can see that the declamation makes quite different um, uh, traces than the recitation. So to give you an impression how this, um, I can only recite in German, but you will hear the difference in the rhythm. The declamative poem was Licht ist alles, was ich fasse, Kohle, alles, was ich lasse. Um, and the hexameter was Arma virumque cano troje qui primus aboris. That's a Latin, a Latin uh, hexameter. I don't know the Mörike, but you can hear that it's um, quite regular, quite rhythmic. And you see that the effect on these um, heart rhythms is quite different, whereas you have, you have here a more stochastic representation, so an activation of sympathetic nervous system. In the lower part, you have uh, lines here, like you see them in the night, but not one for the respiration, but here are one, two, three, four, maybe even five lines that you can observe. And this is very interesting because these are tones and overtones. Overtones um, have the same um, distance from the tone, like from the base, the tone from the bass line. And you can see that here, obviously, overtones, uh, which produce something like a sound in the human heart beat. Um, this was the, the, the part of hexameter and alliteration. Now, as scientists, we were interested how this would um, develop if Dietrich von Bonin, our speech therapist, would speak the hexameter with um, few, uh, slow and faster and faster. And so he made hexameter recitation with 31, 35, and so on, until 30, uh, 62 uh, steps per minute. And you can see what the heart produced now was something like a step ladder. And um, actually, these were four and a half hours of hexameter recording. So it, it's not easy to get these things, but Dietrich was so nice to do it for us. And so we tried to vocalize this to make it um, audible. And what you will hear now is the sound that the heart produces during hexameter recitation. Um, um, played 3,600 times faster than the recording was. So you will hear the uh, four and a half um, hours 
in four and a half seconds. And this, please uh, listen to this. This is the sound of the therapist's heart during this recitation. you hear something? Uh, did you hear something? I didn't hear. Ah, sorry, my. Yes. Um, my sound system obviously went off. Okay, I repeat it. So you have actually a tone uh, scale um, played on the heart and you could perform an opera with this, but it would take a few months to record it because every four and a half hours you need for four and a half seconds. So I played on the piano uh, to listen what the scale was and it was this scale. It's the alpha scale actually. That was played on the heart. And you can see that the piano has the same um, scales like the heart, but even um, stronger pronounced the, the differences between the overtones and the, the background. And the reason for this is that the, um, the, the heart is not tuned as well as the piano. But during the night um, and during this um, experience of hexameter station, it is rather well tuned. And we will later hear something that's very fascinating um, and will introduce you to the world of Momo. Now, um, we published this in American Journal of Physiology and the Time magazine wrote, yes, reciting epic Greek poetry such as Homer's Iliad and Odyssey actually seems to be good for the heart. And so, um, this was very impressive for us. There, there were about 600 uh, press um, receptions of this. So we investigated different parts of the um, spectrum of uh, states of consciousness. And this was with a um, Tibetan um, master of meditation who meditated on nothingness. And you can see here when he's concentrated on the left side and when he's disturbed on the right side. Disturbed was uh, I actually, because I was in the room and this uh, didn't allow him to concentrate. So I asked him if I should go out and he said, yes, please. And he went, uh, so I went out and then he made this concentrated meditation. And the interesting thing is I expected that there would be some new uh, kind of of um, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, but actually it almost disappeared. This man looked like somebody who had just died or was immediately to die during this uh, registration. So I asked him, what do you feel when you make this meditation on nothingness? And he said, I feel like dying. And so I asked him, but why do you do it then? And he said, um, because we in our tradition are used to train dying, because when the moment arises that we have to die, then we want to know how to do it correctly. And this is very interesting because also in medieval, um, in medieval uh, mystics, in, in European medieval mystics, there are some hints that it's very important that you die consciously and one of these uh, sayings say, if you don't learn to die, uh, then you will lose everything when you die. And I think that was very impressive for me too. Now, the next thing we investigated were the different mantras, like um, first we investigated the OM, but then also AM, M, IM, OM and UM. Um, and you see, this is the original registration of the heart rate. And it was very impressive that there was so strong influences on heart rate between 80 beats per minute and 120 beats per minute, just within a few seconds, just by reciting am, em, im, om, or um. Now, was, what was also interesting that the om results in the most stable oscillations. Actually, all the other um, syllables um, changed their shape during the 
uh, whereas the ohm was very constant. And um, you can see here seven times ohm in the conocardiogram. And you see that there are also lines like the hexameter, but very close to the slower, lower part of the picture. And here you have an overview and you see that ohm obviously has the strongest lines and the most stable lines compared to the other, to the other syllables. So this is an overview of our research in this field. And you can see that the heart can count in some way. <clears throat> if you say meditation is a zero in this meditation on nothingness, then yoga, this is the sun greeting, uh, has a one, one strong line in the point one hertz um, uh, that is con consciousness actually, the consciousness rhythm. Om recitation has three, overtone singing has four, hexameter recitation has five, and Eurythmy, and that was our surprise, has 10 different um, overtones, which means that Eurythmy has a lot of possibilities to join to other body, body rhythms. And this was the reason why we chose Eurythmy for construction workers. When we were asked to um, make a program for construction workers um, in which the number of accidents should be reduced. Um, just to understand, you have here rhythm robbers uh, during the day, that's the usual day, working day in a modern society, you are only reacting. You don't have possibility to choose the, the course, you can only react. The only thing you can do here is to go to a sand bank from time to time to um, make recreation, make breaks. But during the night, you should have the possibility to row like these people, which are very synchronized, very focused, and can determine the course better than during the day. And um, as we heard that uh, Vegas is the female power, I think that this is very important for us humans to find this female power in us and to strengthen this female power. Uh, this we already had. Now, now this was um, this uh, group of uh, construction workers, one of the groups that we treated. And you can see they are working with Eurythmy here the so-called waterfall. They have a copper stick in their hands, which they let fall behind their back. And then they try to uh, catch this stick and they put it to the other hand and then give it to the next one or throw it over the diagonal. And they receive at the same time a second um, stick so that giving and uh, taking is balanced and they have to of course uh, mention all the other workers in the room so that they don't lose uh, overview and um, I think it's a really very good um, exercise for these construction workers because they learn to give and take they learn to um, um, take notice of all their, their comrades, and they learn that it's important to um, visit, to, to, to observe also the others what they are doing. Now, um, when we started this project, there was a big press um, um, uh, activity. The, the big company, the big um, magazines came to our building construction site and reported about us. They say the strangest um, construction site of Austria, more scientists than construction workers. And after some time, the construction workers had accommodated to this and they were very impressed about the effects. You can see here, um, this was a, um, a carpenter on the construction site, uh, 45 years old. And you can see here, um, if you look at the right side, it's again the afternoon, uh, the night and the morning. And you see that the night is not very good. He has a lot of sympathetic activity, red uh, sympathetic activity before 
um, the vacation, then he makes two weeks of vacation. And you see now the activity is a little bit better. Um, and it's also stabilizes in some way. And then he, he starts with Eurythmy. And you can see that Eurythmy completely changes this um, figure. And now he has a wonderful five uh, times um, parasympathetic activity after six weeks of occupational Eurythmy two times a week, 45 minutes each. Then after Eurythmy, um, the effect goes back. But it comes again two months after your admit. That's typical for cure treatments, that you have a, a drawback in the beginning, uh, but it goes to good values after some time. And we said, um, if this is really effective, we should should, should also visit um, uh, see it in the. months and sorry i just have to close the telephone um, um, and you see here three groups the groups um, the black group does not participate in any um, eurythmy activity and the sleep quality goes down from 80 percent to 60 percent in during all this time making the sleep much less effective in this group. The blue group first participated in uh, Western gymnastics, which was the one of the control interventions. And you see it also goes a little bit down, but then they were changed to Eurythmy. And here you can see that, that, that the Eurythmy improved the sleep quality of these participants. And the red one started with Eurythmy, and then went to Western gymnastics. And you see that they at least stayed at the same level that they had begun. So the next question was, is there even uh, those um, uh, effect re relationship? And yes, it is. You can see here the changes over the six months. So if it is zero, there is no change in sleep quality. If it's minus, then the sleep quality has decreased over six months. If it's plus, it has improved. And it's clearly seen that at about 12 interventions, you have um, uh, a level which stays the same, but the, many, the people who made many interventions, they had better values, much better values than the ones that had no interventions. And it's even a statistically significant dose effect relation. Now, the company that had given this project um, was the uh, Austrian insurance company for accidents. Uh, it's a large company with 5 million um, insured people. And they were, of course, interested in the outcome of, of accidents and not if they had a good sleep quality or not. So they told a different um, institute to investigate the effects on the um, accidents. And the effects were drastic. You can see here, the, the years before the project, they had around three to 5% accidents per quarter, not per year, but per quarter. And then we came with the interventions here and the accidents went back to zero. And um, they, repeated this in 85 Austrian construction companies um, and the effect was a 49% reduction of sick leave days and a 25% reduction of accidents uh, in the year when the project happened and the year after there was an overgoing uh, um, effect with 27% reduction of accidents one year after performing the program interventions. Now, I think we are a little bit short in time already. So I will um, skip this um, and go to the last part of our, um, maybe this picture um, is it's, it's rather important because it shows the effectiveness of these um, chronobiological interventions. We made this with 280 patients 
after hip and knee replacement and looked which parameters were most, which factors were most important predicting the one year outcome of the treatment. And you can see here, we had psychological uh, background, we had clinical symptoms, and we had chronobiological interventions. And it turned out that the chronobiological interventions were the most effective ones and the most predictive ones for the patients, how they were uh, one year after the interventions, uh, one, uh, one year after the surgical treatment. And psychology also played a role, 27%, and the clinical symptoms, which are usually recorded by the medical doctors, were 33%. So the medical doctors um, do use only 33% of the available information uh, if they also use psychology and uh, chronobiology, they would have the full picture, but they choose to use only the clinical um, information usually. So what I wanted to show you um, is that we have an anatomical body which is um, in space and was discovered at around the 16th century um, in its full importance uh, by Leonardo da Vinci and Andrea Vesalius, the famous um, anatomers. Um, and this is the basis of our modern medicine. But in the future medicine, we might um, be more interested in the time structure of the human body in the time body, which is invisible, unfortunately. But this time body will give us the possibility to recognize diseases much earlier than we do with the um, uh, space body. And on the other hand, and this I think is also very important, to keep people safe and healthy and in well-being um, before they get into disease. So when, when you see something in the space domain, it's much too late actually, and it would be better to um, investigate things before they are going into this direction. Um, okay, now in the end, I would like to show you some uh, the, the resolution of the Momo miracle. Michael Ende was one of the world famous German book authors for, uh, for children books, but these books are actually not only for children, they are for um, adult people as well. And um, especially Momo, I think is so very important for our understanding. Um, and I will just tell you for, for the people who are not familiar with Momo, what's the background? It's a young Italian girl actually, living in an old amphitheater, but with a remarkable character. She's able to listen to other people more than anyone else. The social paradise that she creates in that way in her amphitheater gets into danger by the sudden appearance of the great gentleman of the time-saving banks. There's uh, in this book, a time-saving bank, which is interested in getting the time of the people. And they persuade the people of the small and dreamy Italian town that they have to save time in order to gain more time. Somehow familiar. This book was written in 1972 just to know, let you know. In fact, the more time the people save, the less time they have. In the end, they who we, we first met as lively and vital people who had time for each other became more and more empty shells of themselves. It turns out that saving time is closely linked to what characterizes our time today, just as much as the lack of time, the greed for money and pleasure. No more. The stray girl, which uh, lives in the outskirts of the city in her dilapidated amphitheater, sees through the deception of the great gentleman and is not inspired by saving time or by a Barbie doll offered to her with all accessories. Her great quality, which is also appreciated by all her friends, is the ability to listen to other people so that they feel completely understood. Ultimately, this ability enables her to meet Master Hora, the Lord of human time, and to defeat the Grey Lords without having to fight them with violence. It turns out that the Grey Lords 
have not received something in their lives as children, namely attention and love. This has prevented them from remaining human. And I would like uh, to ask now to um, Grace to read the part which will introduce the um, music that we will hear in the end of this lecture. I will read now, Max, or you will still play some music. Sorry? Should you, I read you, now? You read now, you read okay. now. I will read yes, now. Mm -hmm. I'm not frightened, said Momo. Professor Hora nodded slowly. He gave her another searching stare. Then he said, would you like to see where time comes from? Yes, she whispered. I'll take you there, said the professor, but only if you promise not to talk or ask questions. Is that understood? Momo nodded. Professor Hora stooped and picked her up. All at once, he seemed immensely tall and old, but not as a man grows old, more in the manner of an ancient tree or primeval crag. Clasping Momo with one arm, he covered her eyes with his other hand, so gently that it felt as if snowflakes were landing on her cheeks like icy thistledown. Momo sensed that he was striding down a long, dark tunnel, but she felt quite safe and utterly unafraid. At first, she thought she could hear her own heartbeats, but then she became more and more convinced that they were really the echoes of the professor's footsteps. After what seemed a very long way, he put Momo down. His face was close to hers when he removed his hand from her eyes. He gave her a meaningful look and put a finger to his lips. Then he straightened up and stepped back. Everything was bathed in a sort of golden twilight. When her eyes became accustomed to it, Momo saw that she was standing beneath a mighty dome as big as the vault of heaven itself, or so it seemed to her, and that the whole of this dome was made of the purest gold. High overhead, in the very center of the dome, was a circular opening to which a shaft of light fell straight on to an equally circular lake whose dark, smooth waters resembled a jet black mirror. Just above the surface, glittering in the shaft of light with the brilliance of a star, something was slowly and majestically moving back and forth. Momo saw that it was a gigantic pendulum, but one with no visible means of support. Apparently weightless, it soared and swooped above the mirror smooth water with bird-like ease. As the glittering pendulum slowly neared the edge of the lake, an enormous water lily bud emerged from its dark depths. The closer the pendulum came, the wider it opened, until at last, it lay full blown on the surface. Momo had never seen so exquisite a flower. It was composed of all the colors in the spectrum, brilliant colors such as Momo had never dreamed of. While the pendulum hovered above it, she became so absorbed in the spectacle that she forgot everything else. The scent alone seemed something she had always craved without knowing what it was. 
But then, very slowly, the pendulum swung back. And as it did so, Momo saw to her dismay that the glorious flower was beginning to wilt. Petal after petal dropped off and sank into the blackness below. To Momo, it was as if something unutterably dear to her were vanishing beyond recall. By the time the pendulum reached the center of the lake, the flower had completely disintegrated. At that moment, however, a new bud arose near the opposite shore. And as the pendulum drew nearer, Momo saw that an even lovelier blossom was beginning to unfold. She walked around the lake to inspect it more closely. This new flower was altogether different from its predecessor. Momo had never seen such colors before, but these colors seemed richer and more exquisite by far. The petals too gave off a different and far more delicious scent. And the longer Momo studied them, the more marvelous in every detail she found them. But again, the glittering pendulum swung back. And as it did so, the glorious blossom withered and sank, petal by petal, into the dark and unfathomable depths of the lake. Slowly, very slowly, the pendulum proceeded on its way, but not to exactly the same place as before. This time, it checked its swing a little way further along the shore. And there, one pace from where it had previously paused, another bud arose and unfolded. To Momo, this seemed the loveliest lily of all, the flower of flowers a positive miracle. She could have wept aloud when this perfect blossom too began to fade and subside into the depths. But she remembered her promise to Professor Hora and uttered no sound. Meanwhile, the pendulum had returned to the opposite shore, another pace further along, and a fresh bud broke the glassy surface. As time went by, it dawned on Momo that each new blossom differed entirely from those that had gone before and that it always seemed the most beautiful of all. She wandered around the lake, watching flower after flower unfold and die. Although she felt she would never tire of this spectacle, she gradually became aware of another marvel, one that had escaped her till now. She could not only see the shaft of light that streamed down from the center of the dome, she could hear it as well. At first, it reminded her of wind whistling in distant treetops, but the sound swelled until it resembled the roar of a waterfall or the thunder of waves breaking on a rocky shore. More and more clearly, Momo perceived that this mighty sound consisted of innumerable notes whose constant changes of pitch were forever weaving different harmonies. It was music, yet it was also something else. All at once, she recognized it as the faraway music she had sometimes faintly heard while listening to the silence of a starry night. But now, as the sound became ever clearer and more glorious, she sensed that it was the resonant shaft of light that summoned each bud from the dark depths of the lake and fashioned it into a flower of unique and inimitable beauty. The longer she listened, the more clearly she could make out individual voices, not human voices, 
but notes such as might have been given forth by gold and silver and every other precious metal in existence. And then beyond them, as it were, voices of quite another kind made themselves heard, infinitely remote, yet indescribably powerful. As they gained strength, Momo began to distinguish words uttered in a language she had never heard before, but could nonetheless understand. The sun and moon and planets and stars were telling her their own true names and their names signified what they did and how they all combined to make each our lily flower and fade in turn. Suddenly, Momo realized that all these words were directed at her. And from where she stood to the most distant star in space, the entire universe was focused upon her like a single face of unimaginable size, looking at her and talking to her. What overcame her then was something more than fear. A moment later, she caught sight of Professor Hora silently beckoning to her. She ran to him and buried her face in his chest. Taking her in his arms, he put one hand over her eyes as before, light as thistledown, and carried her back along the endless tunnel. Again, all seemed dark, but again she felt snug and secure. Once they were back in the little clock-lined room, he laid her down on the sofa. Professor Hora, Momo whispered, I never knew that everyone's time was so... She strove to find the right word, but in vain. So big, she said eventually. What you've just seen and heard wasn't everyone's time, the professor replied. It was only your own. There's a place like the one you visited in every living soul, but only those who let me take them there can reach it nor can it be seen with ordinary eyes. So where was I? In the depths of your own heart, said the professor, gently stroking her tousled hair. Now we come to the last slide of this lecture. And um, what I would like to show you now is something that was deeply impressing for us, uh, because these sounds that Michael Ende describes can be really heard, not in the work situation, but you will see where. Um, if you look at this, um, this is um, part of the daily of the daily um, heart rate variability during work. It's recorded uh, from a um, medical doctor in Germany who is working in the in the uh, clinic in a clinic uh, endoposophical clinic, and during work. Um, it sounds like this, this again with one second is one hour of heart rate variability so that we can hear it. So this doesn't sound very musically, does it? 
Uh, then we have the situation during REM sleep, the dream um, time. And this sounds a little bit more musical. And then we have the deep sleep and listen to this one. So I asked the musician to put these samples on a synthesizer and to um, put on a keyboard and to produce music from it. And he said he couldn't produce music from the work uh, recording, but percussion would be possible. So he sliced um, sequences from the um, 24 hours, which were suited for percussion, and it sounded like this. So this obviously is our work life. And then um, he took the dream time, which was a little bit more musically, and it sounded like this. And in the last step, he worked with the deep sleep. And now you might hear something that Michael Ende describes. Just listen. So just remember that all this is um, the sound that our heart produces. There was nothing added except a little bit of um, reverberation, which is done in every music. But it's this, the language of our heart when we are in a deep sleep. Thank you very much for your attention and I enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, and uh, we're already uh, seven minutes before nine. I don't know, Ming Yu, do you still want to uh, say something for the Chinese audience? There are questions with, which I would uh, answer in English for sure. How is it, Ming Yu? No, Ming Yu. So then I will say, look, there's. Uh, 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 now I will introduce a little bit about uh, the, the, the translation of, uh, of uh, our new book with uh, Professor okay, Bosa. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. 好的, uh, 各位这个华语区的朋友们大家好然后莫泽教授的简介
呃，这个德国包括一些英语国家都是一本呃比较畅销的书，然后还有一本和两还有两本跟节奏相关的，因为整个这个莫泽教授的这个刚才的讲座哈，我也认真的听了，非常的精彩，也都很多都是跟节奏跟 rhythm 有关的，所以我们有两本书也是和这个节奏相关的。我们这三本书呢，现在都在翻译，整个这个。翻译出版的这个过程呢，我们希望还是有部分的书呢，能够去以正式出版物的形式来呈现给大家。呃，这个流程呢，简单呢是这样的。我们呢也是希望，呃，可以邀请到更多的这个感兴趣的朋友们可以参与到这个里面，因为呃，可能熟悉的朋友都知道哈，出一本书的话，现在大部分都是自费，自费的话一本书差不多要十万，这个有的可能更要更多。像我们的《十元疗愈之路》一本书就花了二十万。然后，呃，我们也是希望能有一些这个有投资意向的，或者是可以去做这个呃出版项目的这个朋友们来去一起来合作。然后我们这个现在三本书呢，有一本书已经翻译出来了，这个是呃呃《Life of Song》已经翻译出来了。然后呃还有两本书呢正在翻译中，已经接近了尾声。然后后面呢会做一些时效的工作。呃，我们也是希望，我们每本书呢，作为商业工业社啊，只是一个平台，我们每本书呢都是一个独立的一个项目，我们也是这个有独立的这个平台，呃，然后来去，我们也会提供平台的支持，然后我们也希望每个这个项目不光是能够去给大家带来精神上的这个收获，也在物质上也有一定的回报。呃，然后呃，我觉得这个出书啊是一个非常有意义的事情，把这个像莫德教授啊，包括像老夫斯奶奶呀，包括刚才也这个莫德教授也提到的这个卡尔科尼西那研究院，我们也有很多的合作，也刚刚出版了一本《我们的动物朋友》，把这些书变成这个我们中国的出版物，能够有更多的人能够去看到，能够去这个。呃，理解里面的内容，我觉得是一个非常有意义的事情。我们现在最多的一本书，呃，《清洁的意义》呃，《清洁的力量》已经这个销量已经差不多是两万了，嗯。然后我也可以跟给大家分享一下，我们在《思源疗愈之路》上，这个我们的回报率呢也还是可以，在差不多一年的时间，呃，一年多吧。我们整个翻译的出版的周期比较长，这个三年，差不多，呃，这个，呃。回报的这个这个周期呢，差不多是半年到一年的样子。从资金上来看的话，然后我们的这个今年八月份第一次分配的时候，我们呃四月份刚刚上市的时候，一个月首印的这个三千册都已经售罄。然后这个我们第一次分配的这个按照这个回报率来讲的话，最最低这个也可以达到百分之二十二了。这个还是这个呃从图书出版来讲的话，已经还是可以了，因为现在我们大家知道。因为疫情的原因，这个实体书都不太景气。好，我简单的介绍到这儿，然后呢，如果对这个参与出版项目感兴趣的朋友呢，可以来微信联系我，呃，这是我的微信号码和这个我的微信的二维码。然后，如果要是对预定这个教授的几本中文书的中文版，呃，这个、中文的打印版感兴趣的朋友们呢，可以联系这个我们的丹丹老师，这是他的微信号和他的二维码。呃，可以拿手机拍一下或者截个屏哈，都可以。然后我们呢，这个下来可以来继续交流。Okay, thank you, Walter, and thank you, thank you Mozart. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wei Mingyu. So at least everyone here also could still notice,、uh, feel here that we really have quite a lot of Chinese participants also here with us. Only they are on a different platform. That's why most of them we cannot see. So from my side, also very short、um, announcements.、Um, first of all, you saw already maybe on Mingyu's presentation in the beginning. There are several books out of uh, uh, of Professor Moser. Um, in Chinese now, we're just、uh, translating them. But、uh, of course, also besides German, there are lots out in、uh, other languages, and、um, some of them、uh, are also in English. And I'm putting, trying to put them in the chat box here. That's yep, that's working. So、uh, the secret of biological time, living in balance, and、uh, chronobiology and chrono medicine. Are the, some of the titles that have to do with our topic?、Uh, Forest children just came out, also in Waldeskinder, only in、uh, Germany, and、uh, that is、um, has something to do、uh, with the effects of the forest and uh, the when people, especially children, go to the forest. 
Um, wanted to repeat that really uh, Professor Moser is also introducing what he calls the health guide system. So based on all these, um, on all these research, there's really the possibility um, to, to guide people to uh, better health. And instead of um, treating the sick, uh, preparing the, the people to stay healthy, you know, or also to find early on, um, to find early on the uh, possible causes of disease. Um, I want to announce three, um, three other um, events that are coming up soon. One is from our friend here, Ricardo Pereira, who is online and who is also tomorrow doing a very interesting, um, a very interesting event, the enterprise assessment. He's also part of our partner, the um, World Social Initiative Forum, and they are doing an amazing training, which I've just posted, the LIT training, that is for those who have a little time in the next nine months, um, very, very important uh, training. Then, of course, upcoming here in the Philippines in um, the end of October is the International Postgraduate Training for Anthroposophical Medicine. And then for those who have time on the 19th of October, there's a lecture um, about the night when the Bhutianum burned down 100 years ago. and um, we want to um, commemorate this in this uh, um, 31st of December to the 1st of January. And I've put all those files down here in the chat box. Um, all those who do not know what the World Gautianum Association is, this is an, uh, a new kind of um, cooperation between um, between enterprises and entrepreneurs um, who believe you know competition is out it's actually about working together and the interesting thing is how can enterprises work together that maybe work in totally different fields and uh, that's a very new experience that this way uh, one can do things that would just not be possible to do alone or also with the same kind of players. So that's a very new thing. And especially here in Asia, in uh, Europe, we've only started in 2018. And in Asia, this is our first forum. So all those who are entrepreneurial or uh, have uh, enterprises, they are very much invited. And um, Luis has already put it in the chat box again, where you could sign up. There is one hand up, uh, Techi. Uh, I would say it's already three minutes past nine, let's say five to 10 minutes more, if that's okay, Maximilian, then we would uh, maybe answer or tackle one or two questions still. So please, Fechi, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Moser. Thank you so much for a very, very all-encompassing um, lecture. But I have a question. I'm a physician and I practice um, dermatology and internal medicine. And I recently, gone in deep into traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, and also have discovered the use of tuning forks onto acupuncture points. And it's such a fascinating um, interweaving of all this technological um, um, information that you have behind um, validating traditional Chinese medicine. But my question is, because I've just recently um, learned about uh, the system of the tuning forks using acupuncture points. And it actually, I, I find the, 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 the information that you have just given tonight very validating in terms of my practice because the, the, the parasympathetic nervous system is actually very much in play in all of this uh, modality. So do you, have you come across such a practice of using tuning forks or sound medicine in particular, aside from what you have mentioned earlier about eurythmy? And uh, I, I also know of that and I've actually been incorporating that as well. 
So it's, it's really wonderful. I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Actually, we have just finished a study with sound. Um, and I can give you the, the address of the student who made this. Um, that's um, a colleague of one of the people in the audience, Christian Michael, and um, she um, just finished a study with sounds um, in a sound harp where you lie within the harp. And I think it would be good to connect with her, you to connect you with her. So please give me your email uh, in the yes, chat sir. and I will, I will send you her. Thank um, you very much. You're very Thank welcome. The, the results are uh, significant and positive. And, and maybe just to let you know, um, we have a, a small acupuncture tradition in Austria. Um, there was the Iceman, Ötzi. Yes, and the Iceman. You know, uh, that was also our institute that investigated this. Oh. And it was said and in science that um, Ötzi was one of the first acupuncture patients known to history because he had tattoos on the acupuncture points. But, but it's also, if, if you could see how tuning forks could be placed on the acupuncture points, it's amazing how, how even as well, in, not in the, in the 12 meridians, but in the eight extraordinary vessels, which is the, the unmanifest aspect of the human being. So it's really delving into, into the quantum area. Yes, so it's of a carry on, I think. It's a, a yeah. field investigating. Yeah, I, I'd love to, to, to meet your colleague, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. There's a question from a Chinese participant asking what instrument was used for the measurements in the research? We uh, investigated first all instruments on the market and we were not content with each of them. So we developed our own version of this. And um, that would be also something um, if there is an entrepreneur who wants to uh, invest in this, because we have a lot of knowledge, but a little money, unfortunately. And um, the, the accuracy of the instrument is still unmatched by other, by other equipment on the market. So it would make sense to use this very accurate instrument as a gold standard for measuring heart rate variability. Uh, you have, uh, These yeah. Chinese entrepreneurs, you heard it. I hope it was translated well. So Albert, bis dran. Yes, uh, hello. Thanks a lot. It was uh, mind blowing. Basically, lots of lots of uh, <laughs> lights going up. I was very specifically interested because um, Eurythmy is such a vast um, system. There's basically a whole language connected to it. Um, what were specifically the, um, uh, the exercises you did with uh, with this very specific group of workers besides the what you what you already showed us uh, with the with the rods with the copper rods? What what kind of exercises were you practicing twice a week? Actually, this um, this waterfall was one of the most important exercises for the group. And it took some time until they performed it uh, good because uh, it's not qu quite, uh, you, you need some um, good feeling for your body to do it correctly. Then um, the Eurythmy um, woman also used um, sound Eurythmy. So, uh, and also the basics of Eurythmy like, um, making an A or an E or something like this. So um, she used a, a couple of different things, but you could read this in the report. There's a report from the Austrian um, accident company, which is available on the net, where you can read which exercises were used. The, the awesome, I will, thank you. Fit, B -A, I, I will write it in the chat. Um, and if somebody is interested, I can also send um, 
it to the group. Are there any other questions? I think it was so overwhelming. Um, the questions will come after the night. Yes, good <laughs> idea. Uh, so um, at any time you can uh, write with uh, questions or whatever um, to me. My, um, wait a minute, my, my cat wants to climb the computer and uh, better, I, 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 don't, I don't let her do that, no, <laughs> because <laughs> she might, who knows. Uh, and okay, I'll post my, my email address here. Um, in any case, you can always uh, reach me and you can also reach Professor Moser through me if you don't find his address somewhere in the World Wide Web. Um, I think we have to thank very, very much all to, you, to all you participants, to all the helpers and organizers, to the translators in China, um, all the participants in China and elsewhere, everywhere in the world, and to you, Professor Maximilian Moser. Amazing, wonderful decades of amazing research. Thank you. Are we diverse so now? Yes, we will now hear the verse from Grace, and then you can yes. still stay on and listen to the music of Aurelio and Svaram from Oroville, India. Good night. Good night. In the heart, there lives a part of man that contains substance, which is most spiritual of all, that lives a spirit manifesting most materially. That is why the sun is the heart in the human cosmos. That is why in the heart, the human being finds his being's deepest source. Rudolf Steiner for Johanna Mücke.
Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye. Uh, what else should we keep for a moment? Yeah. <clears throat>